Hello and welcome to the latest edition of our podcast series. My name is Ian Kennelly and I am historian in residence with Westmead County Council. Today we're going to talk about Westmead's Alice King, later Alice Kennell, a member of Common Amon and Sinn Féin, and we will discuss primarily her career between the years 1916 to 1923. My guest for this episode is Dr. Anne-Marie O'Brien, who graduated in 2017 from the University of Limerick with a PhD in history. Currently, she is a tutor and lecturer at Maynooth University. She has published nationally and internationally on women and Irish diplomacy, and her book, The Ideal Diplomat, Women and Irish Foreign Affairs 1946-1990, to was published by Four Courts Press in 2020. She is currently undertaking new research on the Irish Diplomatic Oral History Project, which interviews retired diplomats from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade about their careers and experiences in the Irish Diplomatic Corps. Today, however, she's going to talk to us about Alice King. So, Anne-Marie, welcome. And uh, you might bring us through Alice King's early life up to about 1916. Alice King, um, as her, her maiden name was King, she was born in 1882 um, and her parents were James and Georgina King. James um, was very well known in, in the county in Mullingar because he was the first vice chairman for County Westmeath. Um, so he was very well known. But she did marry Lawrence Janelle in 1902. Um, she was his second wife. His first wife was Margaret Wolfe, and she died in 1883. Lawrence was actually Alice's, um, she, he was 30 years Alice's senior. So he was, I think, in his 50s at this stage, or 60s, actually. So yeah, they, they got married and um, up to 1917, they lived in England, in London, because he was an MP for the Irish Parliamentary Party. And like, I suppose, many Republicans of the time, his political allegiance changed with the 1916 Easter Rising and he switched uh, his political allegiance to Sinn Féin. And this is really where Lawrence and Alice's uh, Republican activities really take off. In the aftermath of the Easter Rising, Alice visited the jails um, visiting Republican prisoners. So she visited Woking and Aylesbury uh, prisons and really, that was her primary activity uh, in this period, that she would visit these Republican prisoners, um, primarily women as well, and she would give them information on what was happening with the Republican cause, um, what was happening back in Ireland. So when Alice uh, was visiting the Republican uh, prisons in England, her pseudonym was uh, Miss Jones. And she was never actually caught uh, as, as a Republican spy, I suppose uh, you would call her, uh, through her intelligence work. Um, and Helena Maloney actually wrote in the witness statements that, you know, she was their view to the outside world. So she was their link to what was happening outside the prison walls. She really? She really was, yeah. And um, she moved, they moved back to uh, Ireland in 1917. I suppose so, our, uh, Lawrence could be elected for Sinn Féin uh, rather than sit as an MP in Westminster. And she continues her, her Republican activity uh, there. So she was a Common Amon member in London, in the London branch. I'll just stop you for one second on that. You, she joined Cumnamon in 1915, is that right? Before the Easter Rising? Yeah, so um, she did join before the Easter Rising. But she became a, a lot more active in Cumnamon afterwards. Um, so she actually set up branches in Westmeath, Meath and Rathmines as well. And Anya Kiant uh, has written that she, she couldn't quite remember because she was writing in the 1950s at this stage, but she she's almost certain that Alice Janelle was um, on the executive of the Common Amon branch. So she, she was fairly high up. As well as her Common Amon activities, she was a member of the Dublin branch of Ingeid Naharan. She was a sec secretary of common the chapter and then she became she was elected onto the executive of Sinn Féin along with um other republican women such as uh Kathleen Clark and Helena Maloney so when you think about the 
company that she kind of kept, you, you can see that she is very much involved and she's uh, very much a high up, uh, prominent member of the Republican cause. Her involvement in Sinn Féin there, I think she was the secretary of the League of Women De- Delegates. Is that- that's the, that's come in the chapter, yeah. As you said, yeah, she's there with uh, Kathleen Clark, Kathleen Lynn. She's high profile people, people who probably have a higher profile than her. But she's obviously at that level within the within the circle. Yeah. And I think that does come. I suppose a lot of Republican women back, back in them times, their Republican credentials came from their male relatives. So they were brothers, husbands, um, sons and it's the same for Alice Janelle. Um, Lawrence Janelle became a very high profile Sinn Féin um, uh, TD. He was director for publicity subsequently. And really, that's probably where her um, prominence in the Republican cause came from. And she must have been well respected um, even outside of, of that circle because, within Sinn Féin, because in 1918, she gets asked to, um, first of all, it's to kind of help out our bring a coherence to Ginell's election campaign, but she ends up taking that over or running the campaign, is that? Yeah, so it's funny because when I first started researching Alice Janelle, I didn't really get a sense of, of who she was. And then the more I dug, the more of a sense I got of who she was. So she was asked by James O'Mara, who was director for elections, um, to go to Westmeath to um, try and help with the Sinn Féin campaign. And she said that when she got there, the absolute chaos and confusion that that reigned, that she's seen, um, she just decided herself to take over as um, the campaign manager, the election agent for Lawrence Janelle. And she really took over his, his campaign. And this is the kind of the first instance that you get that Alice Janelle is very much her own person. Um, she she knows what she's doing. And uh, yeah, she's she's very forthright in her per- personality, which I suppose matches Lawrence's in fairness. When you look at, at his speeches in Westminster. Maybe more so than him. I mean, they both were, I suppose you could say, larger than life personalities to use that cliche. But she was very much an organiser and administratively very, very talented. Uh, that seems in her career, she's a secretary, director of elections, a partner to him. She seems to have, gravitate towards those roles. She is, yeah, she's absolutely uh, competent in her administrative and organisational ability. And I think this is her strength. And it really did help Lawrence's uh, career, um, particularly afterwards when, when he left um, Ireland for, for South America. Um, she really comes into her own. Yeah. And that period, he gets elected in 1918. And then you have the first all air and you have the War of Independence. And that's a particularly, I suppose you could say, traumatic time because he Lawrence Gunnell gets arrested in 1919 and 1920. And how does that affect both of them? Then? I think like it certainly affected Lawrence's health. Um, he was he certainly um, struggled with his health after his uh, his arrests. If anything, I think it made Alice more radical, you know, and, and she just as far as I'm aware, she just continued in her Republican uh, activities even after um, he was arrested. But it was his, his last arrest that really um, shook his health. And that was one of that was the primary reason why they left for the United States. Then, OK, so I just on those arrests, I suppose you mentioned it played a role in strengthening her republicanism because he was publicly treated quite badly. He was manacled and brought, I think, from Dublin to Mullingar. Yeah, like I, I haven't I haven't actually come across any of her writing, but the Bureau of Military History witness statement does indicate that she wrote articles about British atrocities and, and the Irish Republican cause. So she was certainly very vocal about treatment. Before we get uh, to the, their trip to America, just on that point regarding her, her witness statement and her administrative, you can see it in the witness statement. Most witness statements are long, often verbiage, talk, talk, talk. She's got it bullet pointed. This happened on this date, this happened on this date, all the way through. Yeah, the whole way through. Um, the only the only issue that I have is that trying to actually separate her activities from Lawrence's in the Bureau of Military History with the statement. But if you look at Patrick J. Little's 
his is almost verbatim to Alice King's or Alice Janelle's. So I'm not sure if he actually took some of her diaries to remind him of what he was doing. Okay, so in, I mean, it's 1920 and Lawrence has been, in the first all, he was made uh, director of publicity for Dahl Aaron. His health is in poor condition and Dahl Aaron sends the two of them to the United States, first Chicago, Why are they there and what what did they do? So they were there to distribute propaganda. They set up um, a mission in Chicago to distribute, you know, British atrocities, propaganda for the uh, Republican cause, um, like a lot of missions we're doing around the world at this stage, Irish missions. So they were in Chicago. um, He was doing that and raising funds for Dáil Éireann. I'm not too sure what uh, Alice Janelle was doing. Um, There's not a lot of information about her activities. I would imagine that she was Lawrence's companion, his organiser. He actually, you know, she she actually organised his days and what they would do. But there is one incident where the freedom of the city and hospitality of Chicago is offered to Mary McSweeney. Um, so Alice actually takes it upon herself to go to New York, where Mary McSweeney is is at the time, to take her back to Chicago so she could receive the freedom of the city. And she, while there, she meets with Harry Boland. So again, you can see the company that she keeps. She is certainly high up, a prominent Republican member. Um, you know, she has access to Mary McSweeney and Harry Boland. She knows where they are, for starters. So she she does uh, do that in Chicago. That's really the only prominent thing that I can see that she's doing in the United States at this time. Um, as I said, generally, I would imagine that she is secretary to, to Lawrence. Yeah, that's the sense you get that all the publicity efforts are focused on him, but she's there, effectively the person who keeps the machine moving. Oh, she's she's the one in the background turning the cocks. Absolutely. And um, I would say his his career really depends on her. So they're in the United States until 1921 and then they get directed by the doll to Argentina. Can you tell us about that? They're in the United States for I think it's almost exactly 12 months. And then in July 1921, um, they travel to Argentina. At this stage, Desmond Fitzgerald has taken over as director of propaganda in back in Ireland. And the Argentinian mission is, um, it wouldn't be the most active mission of of all of the missions. So they were sent to uh, Argentina and they were meant to take a tour of South America, which they didn't really do. They they toured Argentina, but they didn't really visit anywhere, um, any other countries in South America. So yeah, they got to Argentina in July 1921. um, And I have to say, Eamon Bolton was there prior, but Lawrence's arrival was really celebrated in Argentina. He was was invited to Te Diem. There was newspaper reports and articles about his arrival. So um, it was quite a high high profile arrival in, in Argentina. And here is where her Alice Janelle's witness statements really come to bear because she, she yeah because she really um describes her, her life in Argentina and what she was doing and, and this is probably why I think what she was doing in Chicago was much the same but she really became Lawrence Janelle's manager and his manager and his secretary while there she uh, carved an image for Lawrence so newspaper articles were or newspaper journalists were running articles that were saying that, you know, he, he wants a, a political meeting. He's demanding a meeting with the president of Argentina. And she's actually meeting these journalists and saying, no, no, he's not. He's not demanding it. He would like a meeting, but he's very much in deference to to the president. So she's really carving this image that he's 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 prominent, but different as well at times. But she also takes on the role of a diplomatic spouse here, which I think is one of the things that I find most interesting. So she's hosting engagements. um, She's going to receptions. She's meeting prominent Irish Argentinians. She's carving um, 
kind of relationships with the Irish missionaries in Argentina, which are, of course, part of the Irish diaspora. And this is where she comes into her own. And she she really disseminates propaganda through through her activities in this way. So then, obviously, at the end of that period, you have the the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. What's her reaction to to the treaty? Yeah, they they were not supporters of uh, the treaty whatsoever. They returned to Ireland um, and they, so Lawrence voted against the treaty. Um, Alice obviously didn't because she's not a TD at this time, but um, she, she was certainly in the anti-treaty camp and she joined the anti-treaty campaign. So De Valera actually asked her to go to return to the United States as part of the anti-treaty uh, mission. So she went to New York. Again, she went under a pseudonym of uh, Miss King. And she... Um, She's on her own this time, isn't she, when she goes over? She is on her own. So, yes, yeah, so she was, She actually went on her own at this time. She went to New York and she set up a public stenographer office on Madison Avenue. And really, she was there to promote propaganda. And I think the fact that she was sent on her own really bears witness that she was successful in the United States and Argentina in actually showing what she could do as as an individual rather than as a couple. So four months later, um, Lawrence Janelle follows her out, but sadly he doesn't actually last very long in the United States uh, because he died in 1923. And they weren't together when they died, when he died. The news was actually broken to Alice through Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, who was with her in the United States at that time. Okay, and were they in different cities? They were. I, I can't remember where Lawrence was, um, but she, she he was in Washington, D.C., actually. He was in Washington and she was in New York. And he died, he died in a hotel room in Washington, D.C. And did she remain on in, in that role, that propaganda role, after he did? She remained, yeah, she remained in the United in the United States uh, for some time afterwards, um, and then she returned to Ireland. At this stage, you can see where her political activities really fade off with the death of Lawrence. Um, she takes a position in the Department of Industry and Commerce in the Irish Free State Government, and really, that's that's kind of the end of her her political activities. So yes, so she becomes a public servant at this stage, and for for many decades thereafter. Yeah, tw- twenty years she she worked as in the um, Department of Industry and Commerce, and then she looked for a military pension in the nineteen fifties. And she got it. She did get it, which um, you know a lot of women didn't in that time, but she did have to prove her credentials. Um, so I know Anya Kjant, Lou Kearney, Helena Maloney, um, they all wrote letters stating what Alice Janelle was doing um, in the t- time frame from 1918 to 1923. And even Sean Noonan, who I think was Secretary of the Department of External Affairs uh, at that time, said, yes, as far as my memory recollects, um, she was in the United States and Argentina, but she has such, um, her personality is such that I would take her her based on her word, basically that she's trustworthy. Okay, so unlike many high level or well-known Republican women, she does not have a political career or become a political activist in the period after 1923. She effectively becomes a private citizen and works as a public servant. She does. She remains. She remains in uh, in Dublin for much of her working life, and then in her later years, she actually returns uh, to Westmeath. Okay. And before we finish up, I just have a couple of kind of broader questions. One of them is uh, about about her life and career and her legacy. You've written about uh, Irish women and Irish foreign policy, Irish diplomats for a later period. But is there any sense of continuity between? between those people and somebody like Alice King, or is she a self-contained? She worked in that period and she has no connection to later events or did she inspire people or was she known about even? I don't think she was known about. 
much of her life, I think, is still actually quite hidden. You know, there's no there's no biography of Alice King or, or I, as far as I'm aware, the only the only written pieces um, have been what like, you know, my own tentative research, which is not extensive. So I don't think she served as a role model um, for the later female diplomats. They kind of viewed themselves as the first female diplomats. Um, but she certainly for the time period, there's definitely continuity in what the wives were doing. Um, So you have people like Maraid Gavin Duffy, George Gavin Duffy's wife, Koch O'Kelly, Sean T. O'Kelly's wife. Um, And they're all doing the same as Alice Janelle there. They're running propaganda. They're um, secretaries for their husband. They're even in Koch O'Kelly's case, she's translating documents because she's fluent in French. So you can see here where Dahl Aaron is really expecting wives to take on this unpaid, unacknowledged and informal role uh, that they would actually support and help their husbands. So she certainly fits into the time period that she was working in. Okay, yeah, very much. And just then to finish up, what's your personal feeling about her, her life and career and her legacy as such as it exists? I think it's it's quite difficult to separate Alice from Lawrence as I said like the witness statements it's very difficult to know who's doing what and she certainly kind of describes her work or his work in the plural so it's us and we and they were certainly a diplomatic team but I think that being said more research needs to be done about Alice King the person and her life and and you know what she actually contributed to the Republican cause, separate of of Lawrence. So yeah, I, I would love to actually do more research about her and kind of try and learn learn more because of course they didn't have children either. There's no direct descendants from from Alice and, and Lawrence. So yeah, I, I would love to know more about her. Um, but I think she certainly contributed to the Republican cause in ways that are not yet fully recognised. I think that's fair to say. Hopefully in this episode, we've given her some recognition. I'd like to thank my guest today, Dr. Anne-Marie O'Brien, author of The Ideal Diplomat, Women and Irish Foreign Affairs, 1946-1990, to published by the Four Courts Press. And thank you for listening.